Hey there, I'm Greg Finn. And I'm Christine Zernheld. AKA Shep. And it is officially Marketing O'Clock. Here on September 13th, 2019. Remember, you can catch our famous Friday news shows each and every Friday morning. We read all the news. So you don't have to. And if you want to follow along with us, just check out our show notes. Head over to marketingoclock.com for all the links from today's articles. And please subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Shep, we've got a lot of news here this week. Yes, we do. And the first one comes from Google, and it pertains to SEOs specifically. And there's been a big change to no follow. And first off, no follow links can now be used in ranking. And second off, there are new types of link attributes, UGC and sponsored. So that might have gone right over your head, but don't worry. I'm going to quickly explain how we got to where we are today because it actually matters to people. So quickly, what? let's go through what is a nofollow link. I think you mean what was, RIP and peace. RIP and peace. Okay, so what was a nofollow link? And if we take it back to the earliest days of Google, say 2002, 2003, pre-IPO, Google had risen to power because they had a better algorithm. People use Google because it was better than Yahoo or Dogpile or Lycos <laughs> or any of these other sites. It was a better product. And instead of looking at just the content on the page, Google really pioneered different ranking signals and factors, right? So mm -hmm. if you've got links coming in, that's a big signal. It's a vote of popularity. It's a, a positive for a website. So links mattered Anytime I say Google, something about Google, my assistant just starts talking. That's what it's supposed to I hope, do. I hope, I, hope, I hope she doesn't know I'm, tra I'm, <laughs> I'm going to trash her here. <laughs> I'm Cover not your really, ears, not really, Google. Not really. So linked ma links mattered then, and they still do now. So you're following the importance of a link. Yes. Okay. So then people saw that links matter, and spam became rampant, right? You'd see people commenting on every blog post with blog spam and linking back to their crappy website, <laughs> you know, with some really keyword rich anchor text because it was a link and that was something that mattered. So this clearly was bad. But what you can never do is take away links because that's helpful for users, for everybody, right? If you are a good commenter and people might want to learn more about you or who you are, where you come from, um, like what company, you can click through and go there and get more information. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. So you can't just get rid of links. So Google made something called the no follow link attribute. And this was mainly made to combat spam comments back in 2005. And people would use it as well for things that were paid because Google had a crusade against paid links because it messed with their algorithm, right? It, you're manipul trying to be manipulative towards your rankings. All right. So what the no follow link ended up doing is stopping the flow of page rank or, or value from one site to another, and it halted any crawling or indexing purpose of this link. So you could say, hey, I saw this over here. I don't really know anything about it. I don't want to pass any value. I don't want to, to say that I'm part of this. I'm going to put a no follow attribute on my link and I don't pass any value out to this person. Mm -hmm. Or same thing, somebody commented on this post, I don't want to give them value. I don't want them to keep trying to hammer me with spam by trying to get value. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So then no follow basically evolved a little bit here, and, and we're going to get to it in a minute. But but you any link that you didn't vouch for, you could use this on. And then we're going to I'm going to table it for now when we talk about the changes. Then we're going to come back to this evolution. All right, well, follow? I feel like I'm at your TED Talk right now. This is this would be the most disappointing <laughs> TED Talk ever. This is like a Theodore talk. <laughs> Just a total, total square. Okay, so now the tables have turned. September 10th, Google has announced that they will use nofollow links in ranking. However, <laughs> they won't use it for crawling or indexing until March 1st, 2020. Okay. And so are you with me? Yes, yeah, so far I'm here. Okay, no follow used to not be a ranking. It would not pass value. Now it will. It's considered a hint. <laughs> a hint. <laughs> a 
hint. Okay. That's not like a technical. <laughs> term. No, it's very, te- very technical. <laughs> Look it up. Duck, duck, go in. Okay. So you have a choice now. You can use the new attributes sponsored or UGC, or you can stay using RHEL nofollow. UGC user generated content. User generated content. And you have a choice. And Google doesn't care what you use. You can do nothing to your nofollow links, or you can change them if you want to be more granular, right? You've got a paid sponsorship you can use sponsored. Okay, so I just explained it to you, Shep. So what should you use? I don't know. <laughs> Neither does anybody. <laughs> Nobody's telling me. Google honestly says, do what you want. So if you've got all these links nofollow and you don't want to do the work, just leave them. Danny Sullivan on his at Danny Sullivan Twitter account stated that the two new attributes are a voluntary cho- are, are voluntary choices for those who find it useful to be more granular. And they went on to say, use them, don't, it's a choice. So if I were a betting man, and I am, <laughs> I would say that in the year 2024, we'll be using these for the most part. They make way more sense. If you don't want to pass value for some reason, you have an actual reason for the most part why you don't want that value to go to a different site. Mm-hmm. 99.9% of no follow links probably fall within either being a sponsored or an ad or that it's blog spam and or user generated content that you don't necessarily vouch for. There's few cases that are becoming more prevalent. Again, I'm going to get to that in a second. So to me, it makes more sense. If I were Google, I would want more information about what the link is for and why I should consider it differently. Mm-hmm. So I think down the road, it will make more sense to say that it's sponsored or that is user, user generated content instead of just using no follow for everything. Frankly, I would even like more, more options because you're trying not to game the system. And if you have to link between one of your sites that's again, part of a, a parent company, what do you use? In that case, right now, you probably would use nofollow if you're trying to make sure you're not looking like you're gaming the system in in any way. Maybe we could have a new attribute called related or something Mm -hmm. like that. Or maybe we can even do things that aren't so specific to helping Google's algorithm. Maybe we could do a link to social. And on your author page, you could link to your social accounts, and that would be official. Like That stuff would be really helpful as well. So I would like more options. No follow isn't that helpful. Moving forward, I probably will keep everything as is because making that change is difficult. But anything moving forward, if it's sponsored, I'll use sponsored. Mm-hmm. That, that's fine. I like that. User-generated content. Again, WordPress seems to be moving that direction. Look for it in the next update. That makes sense as well. One other caveat, I think that Baidu still uses no follow as not passing any value, you might have to uh, buy do that yourself <laughs> to, to, to see. Um, so if you are really into buy do, to keep no following your, your no follows, I guess. <laughs> and then lastly, you can use more than one value. So if it's a user generated oh ad, you can no follow a sponsored UGC if you're a total psycho. This could get really messy really fast. Yeah, well, hopefully it's at least only those three. Okay, so I'm going to go reach back on the table and talk about how we got to this spot. Okay. The spot's been defined. We've got a few new attributes. So how do we get there? Seems like no follow was working just fine, right? Yeah. Wrong. (laughs) There was a big problem. And we talked about it in episode 82 where Martin McDonald at Search Martin on Twitter had talked about the fact that there is not any real value for publishers, let's say, or webmasters in general, to make to, to not just you know, follow everything, right? And his example was that he had thousands of, of articles created by writers each day, and some people are out there selling links off. And to stop it, his thought process was, hey, let's do a site-wide nofollow. We're not going to pass any value out there, and therefore, we're not going to be selling links, and we're going to be on the straight and narrow with Google. Um, that is not the case. <laughs> And so this turns into an issue now for Google, where now you're not passing any value to anyone. That's not how their algorithm works. That's not how they rank things, right? Like if all of a sudden 
people across the board stop passing value everywhere, how do things work? So this is still totally fine for users. Anybody on, on a site like this will have no different experience. It's all you know within the code itself and within the specific link. But for Google, now they stop seeing this ranking signal. Did you follow me? Yes. No follow. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> do I follow. follow. Do follow. <laughs> okay. So if the entire web starts no following everything, Google has two options really. One, you can start using no follows is hints, like like they chose to. Do you know what the other option would be? Run away. Run away. <laughs> Pretty much fix your search engine. <laughs> That's yeah, another option. That. You could fix your search engine. Maybe buy more data. Maybe team up. Use your Twitter data more. Maybe use your browser data. Maybe use analytics data. Use other information other than just links instead of forcing these links and these attributes on people. That's another option too. Google didn't choose that option though. Okay, so now Shep, I'm going to run through a hypothetical <laughs> scenario just to show how we got here and show why I think this could be a big problem. Mm -hmm. It's 2018. No follows are doing fine. You own Shep Publishing, the world's number one source of user-generated oh. content in very niche verticals, specifically Taylor Swift, oh. Murder, She Wrote, <laughs> and a QVI HSN combo blog that's going bananas. Wow. Okay. What a world. Yes. Your writers publish thousands of articles a day. It takes time to vet each writer before you fire them. So <laughs> you have to see multiple instances when you think something might be sponsored before you can actually make a case to fire them. Mm -hmm. Some paid links might stay up and in an effort to combat this, you take your entire network and you no follow every link. You're not passing value any longer, but users can still go follow those links and get on to where the writer wanted them to go to, to further the story. Mm -hmm. This is great for everyone, but Google, because they don't have those factors that make their algorithm work. They don't have link value being passed. So now it's September 13th, 2019. You implemented that site-wide no-follow and it stopped people from selling links on your properties. You're sitting pretty, you're content. You even just launched an all-new popular blog, the number one blog about the Duggars. <laughs> you're riding high and all of a sudden, Google makes this change. You look and you see there are emails going out. People are, again, trying to sell links onto your site. You don't like the look of it. All the different authors you've hired are back at it again. Oh, gosh. You don't have no follow. You don't have sponsored. You don't have UGC to cut back these hints. What do you do? Um, after I ran away, I would probably... <laughs> Could you just say no links on your site at all? Not, none allowed? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you're trying to stop people from doing these things that are only bad against Google's guidelines, you would say, hey, no more links. But that's not going to be good for Google That's either. what people are doing already. You're yeah. already seeing that even before this is implemented because people don't want to get in trouble. Now, you're, everything is going to be a hint. You're going to break the internet. <laughs> They're not going to be, people aren't going to link. What, what, why would you ever allow people to link They're, your writers? You, you say, wouldn't. no, I don't want to get in trouble for this. I don't know this. I can't vouch for this. Fix your algorithm. What are we even doing here? <laughs> like, fix your stuff instead of forcing this on webmasters everywhere. Th that, that's my bigger problem. I, just, I like the sponsor. I like the, all this stuff. Ooh, my brain is just my brain, it, I'm, yeah. I'm malfunctioning. Don't count links so much. Yeah, this isn't going to fix it, so they need to figure it out. And, and if you thought there was lots of spam before, just wait. Buckle your seatbelts. Buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to forecast what's going to happen. And those, those, those sites that no follow everything, there's just going to be no links. You're going to look at these articles, all the links are just going to be internal links just churning right inside. There's going to be, it's, you're going to break the internet. Armageddon. Yikes. Shep, save me, please. You got any good news over there? I do have some good Thanks. news. <laughs> so we have some exciting news from Microsoft Advertising. 
the platform formerly known as Bing Ads. So this week, if you haven't already heard, Microsoft launched responsive search ads and they're now open in beta. If you'd like to join the open beta, there's a form that you can fill out. We'll link to it in the show notes. I submitted the form. I haven't heard back on any of the accounts we submitted it for. How rude. I know. How rude. So I haven't actually tried this, but um, if you're not using these in Google already, you should know they allow you to provide 15 headlines, four descriptions, and Microsoft will test the different combinations, automatically identifying winners for you, and they'll automatically show the better performing ads. Okay. And do you recommend this as well? Yes. Okay, and why? It's great because, like I just said, they'll automatically test the ads. You don't have to set up different ad, different ETAs for all of your different ideas. It'll test it for you and automatically show the winner. But there's one downside on Google that from this article, it sounds like Microsoft might be doing a better job. Oh, yeah. So in the article, they say you should monitor performance through the combination report page, which Google doesn't really have. They'll show you how the ad performs overall, but not necessarily individual assets. You can only mm -hmm. usually see impression data and not combinations either, just for the individual assets. And that's been super annoying because you can't apply the learnings from your responsive search ads to any of your other ads. So hopefully they have more robust reporting and Google can follow suit because that sounds like it could be awesome. Yes. I, I, I love the day where Google can <laughs> just rip a feature, right, from Microsoft Advertising. Definitely. Love it. All right, on some positive news, I think, from Google on the organic side relates to Google News. And Google is rolling out algorithmic updates to its rankings algorithm. And every time I say Google, my phone just turns on. You guys can't hear it. <clears throat> no, I don't want results. I don't want results, Google. Can you write that down, Kiberg? I need to, like, turn this damn thing off. Google has been rolling out algorithmic updates to its ranking algo. Google has been rolling out updates to its ranking algorithms to give more preference to stories that were the original source. And I love this. Me too. Met so many times, especially in Discover, you find these articles that were just regurgitated, regurgitated. It's like a telephone game. And Google's trying to remedy that, which is great. So original reporting will not only rank better in Google search, but also in Google News and Google Discover. So kudos. This is a really helpful thing. Google's talking about this change because of two reasons. The first is that the quality rater guidelines were updated and there were specific items around original reporting. And then second, this has already been in, in play, apparently. So it's, the algorithms have been out there um, over the past few months, not a specific timeline. And again, it seems like from Google's test, they like it. So Hopefully we get more original news and you don't get these aggregators just eating everybody's traffic. And hopefully it helps people actually invest more in original reporting yeah. too. That's Especially when there's like a big trending story and you just want to find it right away. And yeah. before it's all these like other people reporting on the original report, it's so frustrating. And it's a land grab. It's a land grab mm -hmm. to see who can get the most traffic off of something. In reality, hey, person A already had it over there. What you need to do is credit them, cite them, and then have your own take on it and hopefully provide value like we do right here. Marketingoclock.com. <laughs> so I have news from Cora this week. Cora is getting more visual, expanding images on the platform, including for ads to full width. So if you look at the before and after screenshots of image ads that are included in the article, this change is really drastic. Before the images were just these little thumbnails and text overlay wouldn't really make sense in them for ads at all. But now that's definitely something that folks can test out and see if tech, if test overlay works really well here. And because Cora is so text heavy, it really stands out on the page to have an image there and that as is, you're scrolling. That is the understatement of the year. <laughs> that's like saying LeBron James is good at basketball. Yeah. So I guess they're Cura, trying to get away from that. Cura looks like an Encyclopedia Britannica, like a, a Merriam-Webster dictionary. Mm -hmm. You look at that and, and they mix ads in really well too because it's like a slightly bolder ad. I was looking at a few things coming up on our Shooting the Heck <laughs> after show on Cura and I was like... These all, it's just, it's just like a library. I'm like in a, uh, uh, what is the what? Encyclopedia? What are no. you looking for? 
library? No, it's a stupid way you classify books. Dewey Decimal System? Is that what it is? I was mm-hmm. going to say. It's like reading the Dewey Decimal <laughs> System yeah. every time you're on Cure. I think Cora should get a dark mode, too. Yeah. It's a lot to read. <laughs> yes. They should have a meme mode, too, where every answer could just be in a meme. Oh, wouldn't that be lovely? That'd be great. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to finish positive here. Positive on the Google Your tone side. is so different than it was five minutes ago. I just don't want the internet broken. Nobody does. We're not going to have links, Shep. You, you're, you're turning me dark. You turned this dark mode on right now. I'm sorry. Just keep it light. Keep it light. Okay. We're going back to daytime mode here. And Google is offering more choices for automated bidding strategies. And this is something I personally love. If you're a listener... You can put earmuffs on because this is something I say all the time. Not every conversion is created equal. And with manual bidding, with enhanced CPC, Google will try to bid up or down to either before this week to try to get more conversions. But now there's a new option. You can optimize for conversions and you can optimize for conversion value which is phenomenal Mm -hmm. because if you're Amazon, the price of socks, a pair of socks is very different than a microphone for a podcast. It's a very different, the the value you get back is very different. The ROAS is going to be different. Everything's different on that. So the ability you can do now with enhanced CPC is continue to bid for conversions or now optimize for conversion value, which is amazing. Yes. So, Look for that in an account near you. Next up, Amazon will now let anyone answer your Alexa questions. That sounds like a horrible idea. (laughs) (laughs) Amazon is launching a new program called Alexa Answers, which lets anyone field answers to questions for Alexa, for which Alexa does not are. I'm going to start over. (laughs) Amazon is launching a new program called Alexa Answers, which lets anyone field answers to questions for which Alexa does not already have a response. Wait, did the title that you said a minute ago, did it say horrible in there? Or is that your own? That was some Oh, wisdom. yeah, that no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Just imparted. Okay. <laughs> not biased at all. Yeah, not at all. So unlike their biggest competitor, Google Assistant, Amazon is not a search engine and they don't have billions of pages indexed. So Alexa gets most of her answers from sources licensed by Amazon and they use machine learning to find the best answer. But now they're trying to fill in some of the gaps with crowdsourcing. I just think if they already have so many issues with bad reviews, how are they going to manage this? Okay, so I'm going to go opposite. Really? Thought. It, it, it is initially going to be a terrible idea. Initially. Everybody's going to come in. Everybody's going to try to do the, the lowest common denominator, answer as many things as possible, just like you saw with reviews. Amazon has been cracking down on reviews really bad. They, they have. Do you, do you think they haven't? I, they still have the reputation, though. I, I, I agree, but the fines that they're dishing out for fake reviews are substantial. And I think now, when you saw Cure back in the day, speak of the, the devil from the last, <laughs> the last news story, there was an opportunity there to, to go after and answer questions really, really well. And then all of a sudden, when the traffic came through to that page, mainly from them ranking, you got that traffic to your answer if there was a link there, um, if there was links to, you know, maybe a bunch of other resources and something you owned or some just even the resources. So if you have good answers, this could be really beneficial. Like If you could get in there early as a marketer and you can answer all these questions on Alexa and become the default answer or get voted up, like the problem is when people don't try. It's like a plague of the world of everything where people just don't try. But if you go in there and you say, hey, I'm going to make the best possible answers for Alexa, I like it, right? You can you can answer better than what Alexa can give you on some stuff. I just don't, I can't picture myself trusting it if it said it was a user-generated answer. But I guess we could get to that place. I get it, but like like, let's saying. say you hear it and it breaks it down with, and it cites sources and it cites everything and it's a great answer and then there's a link at the end. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Well, hey. You're kind of winning me over here. Look at that. <laughs> All right. Well, that ends our news. Maybe the longest news segment here of 2019. And it brings us to this week's Take of the Week. 
this is a, a saucy hashtag fire digital marketing take with extra spice served up for you. And wait for it here, folks. This week we have the second ever takeoff where we pit the takes of four different digital marketers against each other. And Shep, you're the judge. You're okay. the jury. And you're going to choose the best take of the week. And the theme here is no follow. The first take this week comes from fan of the show, friend of the show, Glenn Gabe. And he had a tweet that says, I propose that Google <laughs> introduces the shrug follow for site owners that are unsure which attribute to use or if they should use one at all. Example, cross-link heavily to your network of 50 sites. Rel equals shrug follow. And he's got emojis of people shrugging. They're really cute. <laughs> Second, former guest on Marketing Clock, John Henshaw, at Henshaw on Twitter. He just had a tweet that said, Rel equals ugh. <laughs> Rel equals ugh. <laughs> okay. Third, I was just doing some searching. I saw this. I, I liked it. It was from I, from Amen Luki. Lucal, I guess, one of the two. And he said, one week later on LinkedIn, we provide high DA, well-balanced backlinks, 30% do follow, 30% no follow, 20% UGC, and 10% sponsored. Smile emoji, smile emoji, hashtag SEO life. <laughs> and obviously that's for Shots these link fired. sellers out there. And then lastly, it comes from Marie Haynes. And she has a tweet, but I'm just going to read off. We're going to do a meme here live. And I showed Shep this meme disclaimer ahead of time. And she said, is that dog the bounty hunter? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the Tuttles from Orange County Choppers. I'm sorry. And I... then she's like, is that the pe is that the guy from West, Co West Coast Choppers? Which is like. Is there a difference? Yeah, it's Jesse James. He's like the number one welder in the world. He's a big welder. Wasn't he? He married Sandra Bullock. I was just going to. Okay, I knew okay. that. They have like matching rain jackets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Man, I got to go over to Shep Publishing more often. <laughs> All right. So first, the first scene, Paul Sr. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Sr. Rel equals sponsored and Rel equals UGC is a choice. Is that his voice? Yeah. They just scream at each other all the time. Second frame, we have to optimize everything as SEOs. And this Pauly Jr. <laughs> so they're father, son. Yeah. Okay. Third scene. Paul Sr. You don't have to change anything! Exclamation, exclamation. Fourth <laughs> scene. Paul Jr. flipping a chair over. <laughs> then why give us the option? I didn't even realize that was a chair. <laughs> yeah. Last scene. Paul Sr. yelling and pointing to help us understand your sight better. All right, and that was the fourth one. So we had oh the, my God. Con the contestants in takeoff. Glenn Gabe with the shrug follow, John Henshaw with Rel equals UG, and Amen with the sales pitch for the link seller, now including sponsored and UGC. And lastly, Marie Haynes with the Tuttle meme. And you can go to Marketing Clock to see the meme. It was way better than what okay, I just did. I really, this is such a hard decision. I love the emoji of the girl shrugging. Her face is just so <laughs> relatable. Um, and that's what I was thinking before I heard um, this West Coast joke. <laughs> it's not West Coast. It's not Jesse James. There's no raincoats here. Uh, it's it's really good. And even though I don't know the show, I think I got to give it to Marie. Okay. So, Marie, congrats. We need to get an award here. Um, but, Marie, you are the... Take <laughs> I off didn't realize winner. it was a chair. Yeah. It's like right in the front of the frame. All right, so head over to Marketing Clock and see what Marie gifted us all. And that brings us to this week's lightning round. Pew, pew. At this point in the show, we split up our content into two parts, paid and... Non-paid. I cover everything to do with advertising, a.k.a. paid, and Greg covers the organic. AKA non paid. Here's what's happening in the paid universe this week. First up, you'll remember that we reported a couple of weeks ago that Google was switching all search and shopping campaigns using accelerated delivery and it was going to change them to standard delivery. We have like five days left, right? No. Oh. You can relax a little bit, Greg. <laughs> okay, good. Because <laughs> originally this change was supposed to take place on September 17th, but this week they 
announced that they were postponing this much anticipated change that was laced with heavy sarcasm. Can I can I say something here? How about you give us March 1st, 2020? I was going to say like 20 when, never. Yeah, oh, I like that too. <laughs> Just give me some time. They're trying to do it so fast. Though. Yeah. So they announced that they're postponing it now until October 7th. So we can wait a little bit longer. But also, it's coming. Can I say something? I get messages in my accounts that still say October 1st. Well, I swear when I first looked at this ar- article, it said October 14th and then it changed to October 7th. I, I, I just looked it up right now. I have another October 1st in there. So who knows, folks? Yeah, they can't who figure knows? it out over there. And next up, Facebook is testing two new ad features. So first, advertisers will now have the ability to turn organic shopping posts on Instagram by Facebook into targeted ads. I don't know what Instagram by Facebook is. I know Instagram from Facebook. Instagram formerly, wait, Instagram by Facebook, the platform formerly known as Instagram. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So you can now turn shopping posts on Instagram by Facebook into targeted ads. Eventually, they plan to add an Instagram checkout feature to these ads as well, which brings me to the next part of this. Facebook is now testing an in-app checkout for dynamic newsfeed ads. So users will be able to see a product on an ad and then purchase it without ever leaving the Facebook app, which just sounds kind of scary. It makes me think of that handprint checkout that we talked about from Amazon. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest question I'd have is similar to what you had with Amazon. If Facebook can deliver things on time quickly, then that's cool. If Facebook sucks at delivery, yeah. then this is awful. Like Facebook know? isn't the brand you're buying from. So how can you trust right. that you really know what you're dealing so with? Is like drop shipping. Like how do you know it gets delivered to the right spot? Is mm-hmm. it like Amazon where they take a, a creepy picture of the package at your door? Like how, do you, how are they doing it? And how can you possibly get all the information you need on the Facebook app. And then are you going to sell this to somebody about what I... That's joking. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to wait and see on that one. Next up, Microsoft Advertising now identifies negative keyword conflicts in shopping campaigns, and Google still can't identify them for search campaigns. That was another little add-on to the headline there. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> wow, feisty over there at Search Engine Journal. So the new product negative keyword conflicts report can be accessed from within the product ad section of the reports tab. That's great. Awesome. Yeah. And I, there are workarounds, and it's, if you've got the keyword and you've got a conflict in negative terms, it, your ad will still show. But let me know these things. And bing, I, <laughs> Wow. Look at that. The platform formerly known as Bing. Microsoft Advertising. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, so I just think Google needs to jump on this train. Like Microsoft has had the negative keyword conflict report for search ads, and Google still doesn't have it. And I feel like it could help them make more money if more people were aware of conflicts they have. I'm telling you, it's catch-up time. That's the theme of the week. Figure it out, Google. And finally, Google is implementing first price ad auctions as the standard as of September 10th. They announced in March that they were testing this, but they're now fully rolling it out and we can expect every auction to be first price. So before, if you were the winning bid on a Google ads auction, it was considered a second price auction and you didn't pay what your actual bid was. You paid one penny more than the second place bid. Mm -hmm. But now it's more what we think of a standard auction, the winning bid bid wins and you better be ready to pay whatever you bid. I like that. Yeah. It it was really confusing before. And I was just retaking my Google um, ads assessments. And I remember them talking about the, you know, the auction process. And I was confused. And I have a a little hypothesis here. Okay. I'm not psychic, but I bet that question will still be on the test next year. I've got a question for you. (laughs) A, A, answer is yes. B, how many times did they call Google Ads Google AdWords in your test? Oh, a lot. At least 50%. I'd say. <laughs> it's insane. It's insane. It's insane that they make people take that. And I tweet them all the time, and I'll, I'm, I have to retake a bunch of stuff, and I am going to tweet everything out that they get wrong in their tests that they force everybody to take. I know. I, I love the screenshots. We should just make a new channel for that in Slack. Yes, Google Ads screenshots. Wrong on the test. Yes. Just train them <laughs> on how to make training. Yes. That's all for paid. Over to you, Greg. All right. This week in non-paid, Facebook is making its own deep fakes and offering prizes for detecting them. Shep, I read this title over at TechCrunch, and I thought, hey, let's get the don't do this department on the case. (laughs) 
that you don't make your own deep fakes <laughs> and offer prices. I read the article, and it's, it actually makes sense. They're trying to use machine learning and whatever to detect deep fakes. And so they have $10 million in resources. That's, yeah. Hey, I could look. They, they could hire me for maybe like $9 million and I could look at the example they gave, and I'm like, hey, that's a deep fake. <laughs> Did you look at the example in the article? I didn't. It's I fell into fake. a hole of Nick Cage deep fakes instead. Oh, okay. <laughs> And that seems like a, a pretty nice hole to fall into. <laughs> but anyway, they're trying to, to, to combat deep fakes before it becomes so prevalent and, and come up with software. And, and this is actually great. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Facebook. Next up, YouTube is launching a new vertical called YouTube Fashion. And YouTube Fashion, you can get there by going to youtube.com forward slash fashion. And it aims to capitalize on the popular style and beauty content that attracts millions of viewers to its platform. Yeah. Beauty's really big. I didn't know fashion was that big, but it, it was also New York Fashion Week this week, so I suspect yeah. that had something to do with it. There's a lot of goofy-looking trends uh, when I went yeah. there. What are you going to watch about fashion on YouTube? I, I don't know. I, I didn't like the fact that when you get there, there this could be something for TV screens that mm -hmm. would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Using YouTube on a, a television screen, I use it with, with Amazon, uh, Amazon Fire. It can be a little bit wonky, but it's really nice. Yeah. And then if you've got these different channels out there and you can browse and it makes it easier, I really like that. So I think that there is a lot of potential there, not just for fashion, but for other stuff too. All right. This next article piggybacks off what we talked about before with Rel No Fellow, but it comes from the Yoast blog, yoast.blog. Google's robot changes the web and the law. And in my tirade earlier, I don't know if I mentioned that Google is now also considering the meta no follow tag. Let's <laughs> try to get everything right here. It's a lot. I just put that all out of my brain and I had to bring it right back in. So they're considering they're, they're now considering that a hint. So you used to also say on a page, hey, don't follow anything on this page. I don't know, I like I don't vouch for it. And now you can't do that. It seemed like an afterthought if you looked at the tweets. Mm -hmm. And Gary over at Google said that their um, the Meta robots no follow is a hint now, like Rel no follow. So that wasn't in the initial announcement; it came out after. And then Danny also backed that up on his at Danny Sullivan Twitter handle, saying that if you use no index in a Meta tag, we still won't index the page. But if you use no follow in a Meta tag, they will not listen to that and from a ranking standpoint. And then after March first, twenty twenty. <laughs> they'll use it as crawling and indexing too. So there's gotta be a better word than hint. <laughs> I'm not going back into okay. it. Okay. But the point the point of the article was really was really nice. Because I remember back in the day when no follow came out, Danny surprising not surprisingly, um what is the word where it's uh quince can you mark that down? So I remember back when no index. What is why I'm keep saying no index. So I remember when no follow came out initially. Danny was the one spearheading the kind of consortium of saying, "Hey, let's get more people in on this. Let's get some standards." And this post on, on Yoast is saying, "Hey, why do you just get to make the rules willy nilly?" And I don't know. There's some good juxtaposition there, I guess, or mm -hmm. ironic just juxtaposition, I guess. <laughs> But it's a good look at just, hey, Google's making the change. You got to do it. Next up, we're just going to keep plowing ahead here. But if you're using a local listing in Google My Business that is distance-based, so you're saying you're within a certain distance of an area, you're now not going to be able to do that anymore. You just have to choose an area. You can't be like, hey, I'm outside of San Francisco. You're San Francisco. All right. Keeping on here, YouTube creators are turning the site into a podcast network, which is a really great article from The Verge. It has cool graphics, A, I love that. You took some time on it. Mm -hmm. And B, there's a lot of good tricks there where they talk about what these YouTubers are doing, taking this content and expanding it off of YouTube. How do you take this and turn it into a podcast? How do you take this YouTube show that you did and cut it up into little bits, right? Like we could, an example would be, hey, if we wanted to cut up this no follow, which we're not going to do, we can have me and you ranting or you 
you know, petrified while I'm ranting about nofollow. Mm -hmm. And you could take that and say, what does this mean? And there's just a lot of good tips and tricks if you've got a show. We started on YouTube and we turned into a podcast. So I thought that was cool. And then just a little vague booking here, or vague, vague potting here. Is that what it's called? Vague potting? I don't, I don't know. We might have some related news here in a week or so about some kind of different networks. So Ooh. stay tuned, folks. All right. And lastly, all 50 states' attorneys general joined an antitrust investigation of Google. A bipartisan coalition announced plans to investigate Google's overarching control of online advertising markets. So something to look out on. Hopefully, again, selfishly from Team Paid here, we don't see any reach taken away. All right, and that brings us to our real life segment. Straight out of our accounts and into your ear holes. It's time for Working Hard or Hardly Working, where we talk about what's going on in our IRL work. Good, bad, or otherwise this week. Yep. What's been happening with you lately? I found something super simple, but it's awesome. Um, I forgot about the change capitalization tool in Google Ads Editor. And it's a nice just little grammar check. You can um, change any of your ad copy into title, sentence, or lowercase. So it's kind of like a double check, too, if you want everything to be in title case or sentence case. Wait, discount double check? <laughs> you can just apply it. Um, I was actually using, like, a tool online for this. Yeah. For my ads and just forgot it was in there. It's nice. And I like the yeah. same case, too, where you've got everything lined up and you want to change something and it just takes it all over. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. All right, and on my accounts, I was doing some targeting within search ads, or sorry, observation mm -hmm. of some in-market audiences within search ads, and I wanted to see how different audiences were, were performing. It's a newer feature, maybe a month and a half old. We'll put it in the show notes to our show where we discussed it, but I was doing a bunch of targeting, or observation, sorry. I keep saying target. Unbelievable. That's crazy. <laughs> this always happens. So as I was doing a bunch of observation, and I made a change of one observation to targeting, and I had all these other observations in there in, in that that were running. Everything else turned to targeting too. Oh my! Were you an editor or online? Online. It so, happened to me an editor, but I was hoping it wouldn't happen nope, online. No, it was online. Oh version. gosh! So if you're doing observation and you change one observation over to targeting, where you're trying to you know bid bid turn something off, let's say um, your entire observation audiences may turn to targeting, so watch out. All right. Now it's time for this week's... W-T-H. This week's W-T-H comes from Jennings Brown over on Gizmodo. And the article is called Wildly Popular Kid YouTube Channel Accused of Deceptively Promoting Products to Millions of Children. And in late August, there's a nonprofit group called Tina, The Truth in Advertising. I think they just took all of the in and put it in Tina. Truth in yeah, I was, advertising. I didn't understand that until you explained it. I kind of like TNA, but or TIA, I don't know, TIA, whatever. They filed a complaint with the FCC saying that Ryan of Toys Review, or Ryan Toys Review, I guess, I don't know. He's possibly the most successful kid fluencer. He didn't know the term kid fluencer was a thing. I knew influencer was, not kid fluencer. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. <laughs> But they were accused of being deceptively promoting a multitude of products to millions of preschool-aged children in violation of FTC law. FTC won't let him be. Wow. I don't know if I said FCC or FTC. I meant to say FTC if I said it incorrect before. So Forbes previously had determined, and this is WTH in and of itself, I know. determined that in 2018, Ryan Toys Reviews earn more money than any other YouTuber. That is stunning. According to the assessment, Ryan Toys Review made $22 million. And the videos are made on a budget of 76 cents. Like That's high. <laughs> That's high. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan uh, is a little kid. I wouldn't say he's a, he's a particularly... I have no idea where a you're particularly going salesy. Like I, I don't even know. Like he I don't even know if he's. Re I wouldn't say he was reviewing it. I think the name's kind of misleading. He's just kind of <clears throat> okay. We'll, we'll get to that in playing a with toys. So uh, apparently, Ryan's Toys Reviews has made sponsorship deals with Chuck E. Cheese, Hasbro, Netflix, Nickelodeon, and Walmart. 
Tina found that the videos don't always disclose when a post is sponsored. And in some case, it, cases, the disclosure given is inadequate. So that's first off. That it was making $22 million, toys reviewing, kid influencing. What are we doing? I Sec second <laughs> off, from the article, they complained that a preschooler's cognitive ability to identify and understand that they're being presented with marketing materials is generally lacking. I would say so. Shop, I have two <laughs> preschoolers. That, again, is, is, is a huge understatement of the century. <laughs> yes. I mean, I watched 30 seconds of these god-awful videos. It's like all I could take. And I can say one thing. There's not one human with the brain that is watching these. A lot of, and then you got preschoolers. They don't know yeah. anything. You'd have to have Ryan say that this is an ad, then explain what an ad is, and then make, in, make a, a, a heckin' Schoolhouse Rocks video about ads and what he's trying to do to you. And, and, and my kids still wouldn't get it. Like, I don't know how you're supposed to... To, to market the preschoolers, it's, it's the baby yeah. brains. It kind of just feeds into the idea we talked about a couple weeks ago that you just shouldn't be able to run ads to kids, but it's just you couldn't police that, really. It seems like it's raining in, in, in the office here. <laughs> Somebody's moving something up here. <laughs> and maybe it's Ryan tapped into the, the feed here. But I, I guess to me, the other thought is, I get it, you should disclose this stuff, but... What, what what should people do? Like, you, I guess you can't advertise to people under a certain age, and there's a variety of people that don't that choose not to do this. Mm -hmm. But then, what do you not like? Should people not watch videos? To, I guess should not have your kids watching videos? Like, it's how too, does it work? It's a very complicated issue. You, you watch the videos? I watched one. Did you like it? <laughs> no, it was really like it was really crazy. Would it's, you sign him to so Shop Publishing? For kids. No. He's just running around all over the place. His parents are in it. I just can't even imagine the amount of money they're making from this kid right now and like what they're doing with it. It just yeah. seems like a lot. And the, the stuff that he's schlepping out there is awful. Mm -hmm. It's just weird. I saw a boss stuff. baby toy. No, I didn't see that. But at the same time, like a, it's like you said, like the kids are just enjoying it. They're not even. Right. Do you think your kids would even watch one of these videos and want the toy, or would they just watch the video? I, I, it's hard to imagine because yeah. my kids are not allowed to. So if I, I allowed them to choose what they wanted to watch, I they might. I mean, I could see they're dumb. They're four years old. Right. They don't know anything. They don't know any better. You know, they're four. So It's like know. when you go back and watch Nickelodeon for the first time in a while and you realize how bad the ads are. But, but also, isn't that on me a little bit? Yes. Like if I, I'm totally. so offended by it, it's a little bit on me, right? Like, hey, Maybe As a I parent, can, yeah. Can I block his little channel or something and, and have maybe just story bots, something educational? Like, I don't if know. If you want your kids to watch something educational, like PBS is the only option. Everything else is for profit. I disagree. Story bots is great. Where's story bots? Netflix now, formerly from YouTube by the Jib Jib people. But you're paying for the subscription. It's on all of the episodes. Well, all the good stuff is on, is on YouTube too. It's a very complicated problem. I'm going to send you some story about songs. We'll put them in the show notes. You'll really like them. Okay, I'm sure I will. Okay. They have Barbie Life in the Dream House on Netflix, too. It's a great program. Oh, I heard she's a coder. All right, and that brings us to this week's Cool Tool. As a reminder, our Cool Tool segment is not an official endorsement or paid mention. We're simply sharing something that we found in our travels that we think may be of use to our listeners. And this week's Cool Tool is the weighted sort feature on Google, in Google Analytics. It's not really a tool. It's I, a tool within a tool. It's a it's a sorting feature. It's cool. I call it a tool. It, it's, it's definitely cool, tool. cool. I agree. So this is an algorithm. An algorithm. This is an algorithm that sorts. This is an algorithm that sorts percentage columns in Google Analytics by their importance instead of their numerical order. And it does this by weighting metrics that have more participants as more accurate than those with fewer. And this results in the expected true value ETV metric. So the example that they show in the article is for bounce rate, and they have a page with one visitor, and it has a bounce rate of 100%. And they show that that will be listed below a page 
with 50 visitors that has a bounce rate of 90% because there's more visitors, there's more data. It's more of a picture of what's going on. Yeah, and this is from a, explained really well in a blog post on ira.net. And it, it's something that until you know that this exists, you don't know what you're missing. Mm -hmm. Because instead of seeing those, those zeros all the time, on what did worse, you can see the huge drops or, in, in, again, percentage increases. It, it's really, really a cool thing. If you don't know it, again, ira.net, go to the show notes, has a really nice write-up, which is why it's, a, why it's here this week. And that brings us to this week's must-read marketing article of the week. An article is so in-depth, so detailed, that we simply cannot cover it in its entirety on today's show. And this week's article comes from kinsta.com. And Mateo Duo over on Kinsta has 22 best AdSense alternatives to consider for your website in 2019. Before I speak any longer on this, I'm going to say that I don't endorse any of these because I don't know them, but I do like options. And so Mateo runs through what Google AdSense is, talks about why people might be looking or why they should look for alternatives to AdSense, and then he covers 22 of the best AdSense alternatives. He additionally runs through YouTube monetization alternatives and then caps it all off by talking about which AdSense alternative is best. So if you're not totally happy with AdSense on your site or you have just some aversion to Google, not that any of us have that here, there's a good blog to say, hey, here are some ways to make money. Maybe some of them are worth testing out, but do so at your at your own caution. I, these are not vetted by us here. I just like the option mm -hmm. that Mateo and gives us. And I didn't us. know there were so many options. So. No. So thank you, Mateo. All right. That does it for today's show. It is now officially not Marketing O'Clock. Remember, you can catch everything from today's show on marketingoclock.com. While you're there, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And we will see you next week.